For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This verse has always fascinated me. It occupied a rather large section of a chapter in my PhD. This passage was likely an early pre-Pauline creedal formulation. In other words, it was a common combination of words, kind of like a liturgy or a Simpsons quote or something like live, laugh, love that was floating around and which Paul, the author of 1 Corinthians, liked and included in his letter. He said it himself, I give to you what was given to me. But what this means is that it was a very early tradition and way of talking about Jesus. And the sentiments are reflected in the Gospels. And so it gives a window into how the early Jesus followers were beginning to understand Jesus' death and resurrection. A similar verse is found in Luke 24, verse 46, where the risen Jesus says, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. But what in particular stands out to me are two things. That the resurrection happened on the third day, and that it happened on the third day according to the scriptures. Now they might seem rather innocuous, but there's more to it than what one might first realise. So that's what we're exploring in this episode. So pull out your calendars to count how many days and whip out your scriptures to see which passage Paul might be referring to, and let's get into it. Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Welcome to the Isms and Schisms podcast. I know I say this a lot, but I'm genuinely really glad you're here. I appreciate your ears choosing to listen to my voice right now. Among everything out there, you've landed here. So thank you. Of course, it'd be great if you rated, reviewed, told someone else to listen to this podcast. That'd be nice. It doesn't take you long and you will make me very happy. Assuming it's a good review, of course. Last week, we looked at Jesus' trial and the person who declared Jesus guilty and condemned him to crucifixion, Pontius Pilate. This week, continuing our Easter theme, of course, coming off the back of Easter a couple of weeks ago, or thereabouts, we are exploring a topic related to Jesus' resurrection. This idea that the Messiah, the Christ, was resurrected on the third day, just as the scriptures foretold. So what day did Jesus rise from his seemingly permanent slumber? The New Testament isn't necessarily consistent on the time frame, at least not in terms of an exact chronology, but that's because, I believe, the reference to three days is not just talking about a period of time, but is primarily symbolic in nature, a colloquial idiom of sorts, kind of how today we use the word several which can sometimes mean seven, or perhaps four, or five, or maybe nine, or whatever you want really. It refers to a period of time that was somewhere close to seven. It has several meanings and usages, except that this idea of three days has a more significant meaning, in that it denotes a really important time, which we'll explore here. But then, saying that the Messiah would be raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, is another curiosity because, well, there is no scriptural text that says any such thing. So what scriptures are being referred to here? We'll explore that as well. Let's start with a look at the timeline in the Gospels, from Jesus' trial where he comes face to face with Pontius Pilate to his resurrection. On the Friday, the fated day of Jesus' execution, 
the Jews celebrated the first day of Passover, the celebration that commemorated God freeing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So Jesus and his pals had a feast on the Thursday Eve, which has come to be known as Maundy Thursday. Maundy, by the way, comes from the Latin word meaning commandment, as in, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. After their feast, they trek it up to Gethsemane, a garden on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus intends to pray all night. It is there, that night, that he is arrested by the chief priests and their armed guards. He is dragged before the Sanhedrin, which was a bit of a kangaroo court stacked against Jesus with bogus accusations, and they declared him guilty of blasphemy. Very early the next morning, Friday morning, Jesus is dragged before Pilate. We explored Pilate in this trial in last week's episode, so go listen to that to remind yourself of what's going on here. Jesus is handed back to the Jews for crucifixion. And by that afternoon, he was expired. Which is actually pretty quick. Sometimes crucifixion can last days. But it was a matter of hours for Jesus. The next day was the Sabbath, which meant they would be unable to pull Jesus down from the cross. So they needed to get it done that day. Joseph of Arimathea convinced Pilate to give him Jesus' body and volunteered what was presumably his own or his family's tomb. Jesus was buried that evening in time for the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, his disciples were hiding out and some might have fled the city. But then very early on the Sunday morning, the first day of the week when it was no longer the Sabbath, some of the women went to anoint Jesus' body where they discovered that he was no longer buried, but was up and about. Carpe diem. So now that we've established the timeline in general, let's get into the details. Matthew, Mark and Luke include multiple accounts of Jesus predicting his death and resurrection while he was still alive. Matthew and Luke and Acts, which is basically a sequel to Luke, say on the third day, where Mark says after three days. Though at the end of Matthew, there is also an account of some of the Jewish leaders recollecting that Jesus had said he would be raised after three days. Though it's likely this was added later. A reason for why there is that little bit of discrepancy between whether the resurrection occurred on or after the third day could be that the tradition underwent some development to connect the idea of the third day to the empty tomb traditions, or to more explicitly connect Jesus' resurrection to the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day of the first fruits offering, which of course is significant because Jesus is called the first fruits of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15.20. Then we can also include the more cryptic predictions of Jesus' resurrection. In Matthew and John, Jesus looks at the Jewish temple and says, See that great big building over there? That's going to fall over. And I'm going to rebuild it in three days. Obviously people think he's crazy. But this seems to be building on an apocalyptic tradition of Jesus being equated to the Jewish temple. That is the representation of the presence of God which really developed following the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Of course, the real historical temple was not rebuilt, let alone in three days. But that's because this passage is not actually talking about the actual physical temple, but is talking about Jesus and Jesus' resurrection. My question is, does this passage require a full three days for Jesus to be raised? as in close of business three days after construction began, when Jesus says that he'll rebuild the temple in three days, does that mean that precisely 72 hours are required? Or is it just a rough approximation? In the Gospels, Jesus dies mid-afternoon on Friday and then is raised very early on the Sunday morning. Realistically, that's not even two days, less than 48 hours. 
Maybe he's just a very efficient worker and got the job done well before the deadline. Now, to be fair, if we consider Friday day one and Sunday day three, then Jesus is raised on the third day, which is still consistent to the gospel narratives. But this idea that the temple will be rebuilt in three days is curious. I find it a little bit curious. When the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus to show them a sign, Jesus responded by saying that the sign they shall receive is the sign of that big old whale. Not really, the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So actually a huge fish, not actually technically a whale, but anyway. If you're booking a hotel or an Airbnb, the exact number of nights is important. That's what determines the cost. So was Jesus' booking in the heart of the earth a good booking? Or did he overpay? Was Jesus in the tomb for three nights? He checked in on Friday night, was in there Saturday night, but then he got up early and was out well before checkout. So he wasn't actually technically in there for three days and three nights. Now, I'm not saying these are inherent contradictions or anything like that. I'm saying that the language here is allegorical, that the important part of this is the reference to three rather than exact chronology. You see, the reference to three days or something happening on the third day or occasionally three years is a very common time frame in the Bible. It is all throughout the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament and is a disproportionately recurring time frame. What I mean by that is that there are very few mentions of any other number of days, two days, four days, 16 days, etc., except, of course, for seven days, which has theological significance connecting to creation, and 40 days. But three days comes up very often, a lot more than most other time frames. Joseph's interpretations of the Pharaoh's dreams mentioned periods of three days. Moses requested of Pharaoh a three-day trip into the wilderness. One of the plagues that Moses brought down onto Egypt was total darkness that lasted three days. After Moses parted the sea, the Hebrew people wandered in the desert for three days before finding water. When they left Mount Sinai with the Ark of the Covenant, they travelled for three days. When Joseph became leader of the Israelites, he gave them three days before they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. After the exile, when the Israelites returned to Jerusalem, they rested for four, no, nope, they rested for three days. Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem for three days when he came to inspect the walls. When Jesus was just a boy, he was missing for three days before his parents found him in the temple, which, oh man, honestly, that's a nightmare. Seriously, how panicked would Mary and Joseph have been? Especially Mary, knowing that this is this is God's son. Oh man, she's going to get into serious trouble if she loses Jesus. But I mean, it's also terrifying for any parent regardless. The wedding in Cana, which Jesus attended, happened on the third day. The first two days being the days he called his disciples, which actually more than likely took a lot longer than two days in reality. Jesus' ministry from the start, his baptism, calling of the disciples, all the way up to his death and resurrection took three years. I know that's not technically three days, but it's still within the same sort of thematic structure. In Luke's Gospel, when Jesus was going throughout Galilee, some people tell Jesus that Herod wants to kill him. Actually, it was the Pharisees who told him that, which is quite interesting. They're the ones to ultimately drag him before Pilate. So why are they warning him? I mean, maybe they were lying that Herod didn't actually want him dead at that point. And they were just trying to get rid of Jesus. But Jesus responds by saying, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. His intention, ultimately, was to arrive at Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was, in fact, a lot further away than three days. 
And he didn't really start heading to Jerusalem until a lot later. So this idea of the third day here was not, again, an exact chronology. This time frame is also found in other ancient religions such as Egyptian, Sumerian and Roman as well as local agricultural cultic practices. So it seems the time frame of three days was a cultural idiom. It's not just a short period of time but an approximate time that indicates a significant important period of time. The next point of interest is that this occurred in accordance with with the scriptures. Paul asserts in 1 Corinthians 15, as the author of Luke does similarly, that the Messiah would be raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. But the question is, which scriptures? There is no obvious passage that fits. In the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, there are really only two, maybe three references to this idea of resurrection. And even there, it isn't entirely clear what they are saying. It's more likely they are speaking politically rather than about any notion of a post-mortem existence or anything of the like, though it is more complicated than that. Nevertheless, the belief developed that people, and whether that's all people or some people, what that actually looks like and so on is of course considerably diverse and debated, people would be resurrected at the end of history when God would come back, redeem his people, and set the world straight. In a very brief nutshell, this is known as the general resurrection. But what is not a part of that belief is that an individual would be resurrected. Everyone who would be resurrected would be resurrected at the same time. I believe resurrection is far more than just people coming back to life. I think resurrection is far more cosmic than we generally allow. You'll have to read my book when it finally gets done. But no single person was ever supposed to be resurrected. That is, no single individual within history would be resurrected. What's more is that there was never any belief that the Messiah would be unique in this regard. The Messiah was a human leader, anointed by God. That's literally what the word Messiah means, anointed one, to lead the Jewish people and re-establish the Jewish kingdom. Again, there's more to it than that, but that's basically it. But the Messiah was not the herald of the end of history. And when that end would come, possibly long after the Messiah had been and gone, the Messiah would rise with everyone else into a new world. Okay, but is there a passage that connects the general resurrection with this idea of three days? Perhaps the story of Jonah, which Matthew does actually reference in connection to Jesus' resurrection. But there's nothing to really suggest that Paul had Jonah in mind. It is fairly cryptic. The closest actual possibility is Hosea 6 verse 2, which says, After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. But honestly, the connection there is a little bit loose. There's eschatological restoration happening on the third day. So, maybe. It's a little similar to that idiom in Luke, today and tomorrow and on the third day. So I think Hosea might be doing the same sort of thing, not necessarily an exact chronology, but more of an apocalyptic or eschatological timeline. One day, someday, there will be restoration. Plus, Hosea 6.2 was not interpreted by the Jewish people or rabbis as a resurrection passage. So it doesn't seem all that likely that Paul would have either. It's also not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. So it seems no one really took that passage as a resurrection passage. To throw another wrench into the works, the Easter stories in the Gospels don't make a huge deal out of the three days either. Rather, they tend to make a bigger deal of the resurrection happening on the first day of the week, which theologically reinforces the idea that Jesus' resurrection is connected to the new creation. 
So it seems there is no single proof text in the Hebrew Bible that Paul here might be referring to. Rather, Paul is referring to the broad sweep of Scripture, the whole narrative of God's relationship with his people. Not just one scriptural passage, but all of them. All of the scriptures, not just a single prophecy. Jesus' resurrection was the fulfillment of the broad spectrum of eschatological hope for Israel. All of it. New creation, redemption, transformation, justice, reward, all in Jesus. Again, read my book when it comes out. That it happened on the third day indicated its significance. It happened at the right time, at the right moment. That far off, one day moment had come. That it happened on or after or somewhere around three days after the crucifixion, sometime close to the first fruits offering, underscores the significance of this event. So there you go. I hope that exploration into this passage, which I personally find really interesting and kind of weird, was as exciting for you as it was for me writing it. Actually, I hope you find it more exciting. In any case, that's it for this week. This episode was recorded on the traditional lands of the Wajuk Noongar people. I look forward to exploring more isms and schisms with you. 